Bună dimineața și bun găsit la BIU! Sunt Sabina Iosub și vă invit să rămâneți alături de mine în următoarea jumătate de oră. O să vedem ce a făcut Parlamentul European în ultimul timp și, desigur, ce pregătiri sunt pentru această toamnă. Today, here with me in Strasbourg is Jean Dutch. Thank you so much for your presence. Thanks for inviting me. You are the spokesperson of uh, the European Parliament and Director of Communication. Uh, our viewers know you. Just um, It was just a, a quick reminder. We are in Strasbourg discussing in the end of um, the July uh, session what has been done till now and what are the expectations for uh, um, the autumn. What is the most important thing if you draw a line after these months? I think that the most important thing is that the Parliament has been able to adopt during this last one year many important pieces of legislation. Maybe we can discuss on this. Some of them are linked to climate change or how to fight against climate change. Others are um, there to support Ukraine uh, against, uh, I mean, during its, uh, its war uh, against Russia. It's also uh, about how to uh, empower our countries uh, for a new industrial policy. It's about migration. There are many, many things that have been done. Maybe uh, also uh, because it's the, we enter now into the last phase of the legislature before the European elections. It will be a, a difficult autumn, let's say, and a very, um, a very hot in terms of political uh, debates uh, winter because it, it's um, exactly before uh, the uh, European elections year. How are we expecting uh, these elections to be? I will start from here, in terms of expectations from citizens, from uh, the political uh, um, parties. Yeah, I think that uh, these elections, 9 of June next year, mm -hmm. 2024, will be probably the most important European elections in the history of the European Union for many, many reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, because the European Union has become a real uh, political subject uh, because of the international uh, situation, situation in the world, what happens, of course, with the war, uh, this uh, horrible Russian aggression to Ukraine, uh, because of uh, the consequences still of uh, the COVID crisis, the energy crisis, the inflation. It's uh, obvious that during these last years there happened many important things in the European Union. It's also quite evident, I think, when you are objective, uh, that uh, during these years the European Union, the European institutions were able uh, to provide European responses to very difficult moments or very difficult situations, as it was the case for Brexit. This was the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, or it's now also the case with the war. Uh, but this, in some way, it's also providing more visibility to the European Union, it's creating a more political European Union, and these two elements probably will also mean that the next European elections will be uh, more important, maybe I would say even decisive. Even though the trust of uh, the citizens in European Union in uh, general is lower, why is this happening actually? No, I don't think so. When I, I, I see the Eurobarometer, which is the, mm -hmm. the European survey that both the Parliament and the European Commission uh, uh, organize twice per year, you can see that since 2016-17, when the British people uh, decided to keep the European Union, the Brexit, uh, the level of support of citizens to the European Union has been increasing. It increased quite a lot during the COVID times, mostly because of the vaccination campaign and also because of the adoption of the next generation program, mm -hmm. this uh, 750 billion uh, euros in, in grants and, and in the, uh, help to, to the member states, and it increased a a lot, especially in the eastern countries of the European Union, uh, when the war started. So I would say that the level of credibility of the European Union is now the highest historically. But uh, let's see uh, how citizens behave, how citizens, let's say, will choose uh, the different possible alternatives for the future of the European Union when the elections will arrive. What will, the, what will be, in your opinion, the biggest uh, challenge of for those who will uh, try to gain some some uh, votes at the European elections well I think that um, now it's nowadays it's really 
more and more difficult to make the, the distinction between the national politics and the European politics. The subjects are the same and they are interrelated. You cannot discuss national politics if you don't take into account what happens at the European level. And the other way around, it's difficult to discuss here if you don't uh, remind yourself uh, about the situation of your country in things about um, the economic uh, policy. Uh, um, of course, the consequences of the war, uh, the energy policy, including access to energy and the interconnectivity between the different member states, migration, of course, this is a huge, huge uh, theme in many countries, not all of them, but in many countries. How can you, for example, make the distinction between the migration national policy and the European migration right. policy? You cannot, which means that uh, parties will have to, let's say, uh, to, to concur uh, to this uh, European elections, more or less in the same way that they would do for the national elections or for the regional elections. It's about introducing their programs, their priorities, to explain to the citizens what are their proposals, their solutions for those problems that are common to the 450 million uh, European citizens, and then, yeah, to the people to, uh, to decide uh, which kind of offer they prefer. Let's see what was uh, done here in, um, in the European Parliament in, in uh, the last period and uh, what are the priorities for the autumn. I will go on, on themes, let's say. Maybe it's easier also for, um, for our viewers to understand. I, and I will start with the war because uh, uh, um, it was totally unexpected. Uh, of course, uh, from the very beginning, the European Parliament um, have had a reaction and also um, was adapting to everything that appeared new. Let's see what uh, the MEPs and you have done here. Concerning the war, I think that the, the first, probably and most important thing uh, has been how the European Parliament has shown, convinced the European citizens that uh, this war is uh, something that uh, has consequences uh, for us and that this war is not only against Ukraine, it's not only a territorial war, it's also an ideological war, it's also a war against the European way of organizing our lives. Uh, it's and the a European values in general. European values, uh, the human rights, democracy, the way we organize our society. So when the Russians are attacking Ukraine, in some way they are also attacking us. Europeans, and I think that the European Parliament has been very vocal, and that the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, has been very efficient in spreading this message and in uh, getting back the support of uh, uh, citizens. But of course, there has been also a legislative work uh, concerning uh, this uh, this war. The Parliament has been in the first line uh, in pushing the other two institutions, the Commission and the Council, uh, to adopt 11 packages of sanctions against Russia, against Kremlin, uh, against uh, all uh, these uh, uh, Putin uh, economic circles. And this is coming with an effect. We can see this in the Russian economy in the last months. And the Parliament, for example, during the last plenary session before summer, uh, has been uh, able to adopt in a couple of weeks with a real fast track and European legislation uh, uh, which will allow the, the member states to provide uh, Ukraine with uh, more ammunition uh, for the next months with uh, more than uh, 500 million euros uh, supporting, uh, supporting this action. So, yes, this is uh, a priority since one and a half years now and it will become the real or it will stay the real priority until the end of the war. We will see exactly what, what are the developments in, in this area. No peace is now on, on the table if we are um, um, extremely uh, right to, to ourselves. There are no discussions, uh, there will be no discussion for, for peace in, in the next month, that's for sure. So maybe some other packages will be needed at the European level, some other actions will be needed at the European level in order to, to really push uh, uh, Russia um, um, away from, from this war. 
going to to the next chapter i will um, i will say uh, the energy crisis because it's somehow linked to to um, what happened um, in ukraine how um, did the european parliament deal with the situation well transforming uh, the covid uh, economic program in an uh, energy economic program. So you know that uh, uh, the parliament, the institutions mobilized a lot of uh, money to fight against economic and social consequences of COVID. And of course, the consequences also from a health point of mm -hmm. view. Uh, but part of this money was not spent. Uh, and what the parliament did was to convince the commission and the council uh, to transfer part of this money also uh, for helping the member states uh, to transform their energy policies and in some way also to help the citizens uh, to uh, bear the costs uh, of uh, this uh, change of the energy policy. At the beginning of the war, many member states were completely dependent from Russia in terms of access to gas, access to uh, oil oil uh, access to uh, to coal and now this dependence has been reduced to the minimum and in many countries it's zero now but of course this meant that we had to invest a lot in uh, interconnectivity invest a lot in getting uh, uh, energy from other third countries and also that now we have to push even uh, let's say faster than we thought uh, all these investments in uh, renewable uh, uh, energy. So it's a huge plan, but it's obvious that uh, this, is, this must be one of the priorities of the next years because we need real energy autonomy. We cannot depend in elements as for policies as, for example, energy. We cannot depend on third countries that we cannot trust. That's somehow a, lessons, uh, a lesson learned from, uh, from the COVID crisis also. It was another type of dependency, of course, uh, that one uh, um, regarding um, uh, health materials from in, in China. Uh, now we are seeing this um, uh, guest relation with uh, Russia. So uh, maybe uh, somehow, somehow we will try to make our member states more independent uh, or the European Union itself more independent. Um, we've seen a lot of debates on migration. You've underlined this. And I will put in, in this discussion, because unfortunately for my country, it was put in this discussion, uh, the accession uh, to, to Schengen of uh, Romania and, and Bulgaria was always linked to, to the migration situation, even though it's not, uh, it's not actually linked. We've seen uh, now in July another resolution of the European Parliament. Yes. I think it was the sixth supporting Romania and Bulgaria as a political sign, as a, a political declaration, let's say, um, uh, sustaining Romania and Bulgaria, I was saying, uh, to, uh, accession to, to Schengen. So what will be done in next in the near future, in your opinion, regarding this situation with the two countries and uh, Schengen discussion and the big um, yeah. policy for migration? These both themes shouldn't be linked. And this is the official position of the European Parliament. And as you just uh, remind uh, uh, to, uh, to people who are following this program, the European Parliament has adopted at least six times very clear resolutions in favor of the accession of both Romania and Bulgaria to the Schengen area. And it's really unfortunate that until now this was blocked by a couple of uh, countries. At the same time, it's true that uh, during these last months, the European Parliament was successful uh, in adopting what we call the migration package, which means the uh, updating and the upgrading of all the European legislation which concerns uh, both uh, migration, migration and uh, uh, asylum and uh, refugees policies. Uh, the European, the Council of Ministers, in parallel, has also now reached an agreement, which is or which could be the basis for a discussion between both institutions, the Parliament and the Council. And once this discussion, uh, let's say, will be uh, uh, finished and successfully finished, this would mean that there will be a new 
legislation adopted, hopefully before the European elections. For this parliament, this is a real priority. Uh, it was impossible to adopt this migration legislation before the end of the past European elections, 2019, because it was blocked by the Council, by the member states. Now we think that it would be important that it doesn't happen again and that this package is adopted before the elections and also that we avoid that migration becomes, let's say, a difficult topic during uh, the elections uh, campaign. And my own feeling is that once this package will be adopted, it, uh, it will be easier uh, to, uh, to get consensus, uh, positive consensus, uh, on the accession of Romania and Bulgaria to Schengen. What is the situation uh, in your country, in uh, Spain, regarding migration? Well, it's always a difficult situation because, of course, uh, Spain is a southern country exactly. uh, with a sea uh, border and also a territorial uh, ground border with, uh, with uh, some uh, African countries. You know that uh, uh, Spain is also present with uh, two cities in, in the north of Africa, Ceuta and Melilla. They belong to Spain. Mm -hmm. They are Spanish. Uh, but this means that uh, sometimes we are fragile when uh, the when there are, let's say, uh, big uh, migration waves, uh, which means that, yes, Spain is one of those countries uh, who during these last years have been uh, pushing as much as possible uh, this uh, idea of uh, improving the migration policy of the European Union. I think that this is the same for Italy, this is the same for Malta, this is the same maybe, of course, for Greece, maybe other countries. Uh, for us, the southern countries of the European Union, it's pretty clear that the only possible solution to migration must be a common European solution. This is not something that just one particular country can cope with. We are under Spanish presidency, uh, that's why I was asking you about the situation in your country, because we know that it's one of the top priorities of, of the uh, Spanish um, presidency, uh, this um, uh, uh, package, let's say, of uh, migration uh, policy. Let's hope that we will see some acceleration, uh, let's say, um, in, in autumn regarding this uh, aspect. Let's move to everything that is green, let's say. We've seen different pieces of legislation regarding um, going uh, to, to a, a more sustainable um, European Union, to uh, having um, a greener uh, member states and so on and so forth. Are there some improvements in terms of uh, legislation, some uh, something good happened in, in the last uh, month? A lot of good happened because this has been the first priority during this last one year and I would say maybe also the first priority uh, through the whole uh, legislature. Uh, you know that uh, one of the biggest uh, legislative packages introduced by the Commission uh, and presented to the European Parliament has been this uh, Fit for 55 package, which in fact is a long list of draft legislation on many topics which are all connected with this idea of getting a climate neutrality uh, before 2050, how to fight against um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, how to reduce uh, CO2 uh, in several fields, including also uh, transports, including cars, this idea of introducing uh, electric cars in the next uh, uh, years to replace um, year by year uh, these uh, other uh, means of transport which are based uh, on uh, fossil uh, energies, uh, all the, also how to isolate uh, apartments, houses, habitations. Uh, there are many, many, many elements which are connected with this idea of fighting against climate change. We all see how temperatures are becoming higher and higher. Still this week in Strasbourg, we are on record uh, and our record heat wave, so climate change is there. And politically, I think that uh, it's uh, obvious that most of the members of this House are absolutely convinced that this must be the priority. It has been the priority of this legislature. It will stay one of the main priorities for the next one. And we've seen also uh, the huge debate around the nature restoration law. 
Yes, uh, um, which means also that we have to take into consideration different elements, how society responds, what are also the economic consequences of the decisions that are taken. And I think, and this is something that probably again gets a huge majority in this House, that uh, you cannot uh, promote this climate change policy if at the same time there is no uh, solid uh, financial plans to help the member states, to help the families, to help the citizens, to transform their way of life, to transform the way of uh, getting energy and to transform the, the way of using this energy. So we've seen a lot of things that were done here in the European Parliament. If you are looking uh, at the autumn semester, uh, we've put um, everything that's around um, um, green, Fit for 55, um, uh, Green Deal and so on and so forth. It will be there in, in autumn also. Migration will be also on the table for the uh, members of the European Parliament to, uh, to discuss. Uh, what else should we... Um, put here what else will be um, focusing on uh, yeah i would say it's about uh, clean technologies mm -hmm. it's about industrial policy uh, how to recreate real uh, european industry again mm, to avoid being dependent from third countries in a very complicated uh, world it's about migration it's a wide energy supply it's uh, uh, mm, about mm, social rights it's about the discussion on the next budget of the European Union. We have seen that this, uh, mm, this way of organizing the budget by seven periods of seven mm -hmm. years was working quite good until a couple of years ago. But now when you see all these emergencies, when you see all these crises, uh, being COVID or being the war or just uh, being uh, inflation or the energy crisis, the budget of the European Union, it's not uh, enough and needs first more money and second more flexibility and this is a, an important discussion that is going to take place during these next months before the european elections and then don't forget that uh, during these next nine months the parliament still has to try to adopt at least 100 more pieces of european legislation uh, hopefully uh, with agreement with the council to be sure that this legislation is uh, completely adopted before uh, the day of the elections what do you hope for the day of the elections? What I really hope, it's a huge uh, turnout, is that uh, citizens have been convinced during this last legislature that uh, this is an important parliament, as important as a national parliament. They are different, but they are both very power, uh, powerful parliaments, the Romanian parliament or other national parliaments, the European parliament uh, as well. Uh, second, that this is a parliament which has been taken many decisions during these last five years who came with a real impact in the life of citizens. I would say a positive impact, but this is to the citizens uh, to judge, not to, to me, and that they understand that exactly the same reasons which are valid uh, to uh, go and vote for the national elections are also uh, valid and good to decide to go for the European elections. These are not second-class elections anymore. The future of the European Union, the future of Romania in some way, is going to be decided also the 9th of June 2024 during the European elections. So I would say to the Romanians, go and vote and decide and avoid that others are taking decisions on your behalf. Thank you so much for this discussion. We will uh, meet for sure again. Thank you very much and as usual, uh, happy to contribute. Thank you so much. Vouă celor de acasă vă spun să rămâneți pe Antena 3 CNN. Nu uitați că ne revedem și sâmbătă viitoare la 9.30 de minute. Cu bine și sănătoși să fim!